It is not a disease, it's a season of life. We all go through this season, not everybody experiences it the same, which is why we're kind of going through all the potential symptoms associated with that, but it does really help to know that you're there. So many women go through their lives, they're busy as heck, and they don't even know that they're in perimenopause and because they're too busy to even notice. And then they come in and say, so for example, last week I had a person that came in and says, Mary, I was, I, I've been so angry and irritable. Like my husband's going to leave me. And, and she's like, I don't know why it's happening. What's going on? So looking at the age, looking what's going on with her menstrual cycle, it's not so regular. It was quite plausible. And I said, it's like, I think, you know, this is perimenopausal symptoms. And it was funny because she's like, oh, I didn't even think of that. And that's the problem. And that's why we're here today, because we don't have time to think about it. So we want to provide you the information so that you go, oh, that's what's happening. And actually be able to be proactive in your approach to dealing with the perimenopause and menopause. And so today we're discussing the symptoms that we encounter beyond what you read on Google or what you think about when it comes to menopause. But and then the next time we're going to discuss what we can do about it. And before we go on, if you like what we're saying so far, please subscribe and share because this conversation is so important and we don't want people to go down that rabbit hole of misinformation, misguided information. So we are, here we are, okay? We are going to teach you the symptoms of perimenopause that you may not have realized are actually perimenopause. Like you said, patients with irritability or rage just before the period when before maybe you never had that, or perhaps you're suddenly experiencing joint pains. I had a patient who was perfect or felt healthy through perimenopause. And then she had her last period, which is officially menopause. And then a year later, after discovering she had been in post-menopause, you know, marking the last period as menopause, she felt like she couldn't walk and her joints were hurting her. So uh, she had been to, she traveling and she was, um, uh, came back and was put on hormone replacement therapy and she could walk again. So it was like quite outstanding for her to discover that maybe it's not that I need to be on NSAIDs and that maybe it's connected that this doctor even figured it out. Because many doctors, you know, are unsure, you know, joint pain suddenly hit, you would just say, oh, osteoarthritis, you're aging, dear. But what if it's because of the change in hormones, right? So From I love highs that. to low. Yeah. So I loved it that this doctor said, oh, perhaps the joint pain is not from, you know, uh, over-exercising or whatever from the past, but, and we are here, but it can be partly due to menopausal symptoms. So I love that, right? So this doctor figured it out. So that's why we're here to tell you. So there's a study in the UK in taking about 409 women and they were looking at the most common symptoms and 91.7% claim that they have vasomotor symptoms, which means the hot flashes, the night sweats. And then with regards to trouble sleeping, 68.2% claim that there's a disruption in their sleep. It is super common. And then Maybe more surprising is the whole psychological piece of what we talked about, the rage, the irritability, and that's 63.6%. And lastly, urinary symptoms, which is 49.1%. And so let's speak to all this. And then there's even much more than that. So I think we need to list more. And uh, do you want to speak to what happens? Like, and, and do we talk about why we have these symptoms too? Yeah, let's brush over that or discuss a little bit, not go into too much detail, but the vasomotor symptoms, I would say, is the, are the most common symptoms, just as reported, that we associate with perimenopause. Someone has hot flashes, night sweats, um, which basically means that you're in the middle of the night and you're throwing off the covers and you're covering yourself back up and it's waking you up through the night. Uh, insomnia might very well because be because of the hot flashes or the night sweats. And hot flushes would be uh, where you feel hot. You might feel like you might even show a discoloration like red on the face, red on your chest, not because of anxiety, but because an actual 
change in the circulation to that area. And with that, you can also experience cold flushes, I've learned recently. So it doesn't just mean hot. You can actually wake up cold or have a flush of cold. It's like instead of an internal feeling of heat, it's an internal feeling of cold. And with insomnia, what you may notice is that in your 30s, late 30s or early 40s, when you're starting to go through perimenopause, because perimenopause can last for seven to 10 years before the official end of the menstrual cycle, the last period meaning marking menopause, you can start to feel symptoms of insomnia or difficulty sleeping the week before the period. It kind of gets condensed there first. You might start to notice that as the very first symptom or hot flushes or night sweats within that week as your hormones are going down. So it's important to note that you might not have these symptoms all the time, but to kind of pay attention to them and track them, look at the frequency, the intensity, and see if perhaps they are happening that week before the period. And then, of and course, irregular periods seems quite obvious. Some women, uh, when they go into early menopause, for example, uh, I, had a, I have had patients where they will go into early perimenopause, they'll have irregular periods and they might get misdiagnosed with a thyroid problem or polycystic ovary syndrome, which is where you have, you know, delayed menstrual cycles or early cycles or missing cycles. And because because of age, you go into your family doctor and you say, I haven't had a period for like three months, what's going on? And the person's in their early uh, 40s or late 30s, and that seems too early to go through menopause or perimenopause. And it's really important to know that it's not just the irregular periods, there's a whole other uh, slew of symptoms that can come with it. And you don't need an official test, although it does help. It is helpful in that circumstance to diagnose perimenopause, because sometimes you miss the timing for testing for the hormones associated with perimenopause. So you might be told, no, you're not in perimenopause when really you are specifically follicle stimulating hormone. We can talk to that. So when you say diagnose perimenopause and menopause, yeah, we want to be very careful to claim that these are not di uh, like doses of disease. Yes. These are transitions of time. It, they, it's part of your reality. All people with ovaries and uteruses will go through this. And so it's a transition. It's yeah. not a problem. And we need to understand these symptoms and really, I see it as it's a sign to say, hey, maybe it's time to slow down and do things differently, to behave a little differently, to honor ourselves through this journey. And we're going to do an episode on this in, in, like next time and then one after. But uh, so speaking to more of the symptoms, we can now include other signs and symptoms to say, hey, maybe we need to be kinder to our bodies because when we have other things like um, the skin can get thinner, the, the hair also can get more thin. Some women experience severe itching actually in their scalp or in their bodies. Um, and we mentioned mood changes and certainly we get, can experience fatigue and burnout. And one of the reasons can be, it's like we're trying to do the exact same thing like we were in our 20s. Yes, absolutely. It is not a disease. It's a season of life. We all go through this season. Not everybody experiences it the same, which is why we're kind of going through all the potential symptoms associated with that. But it does really help to know that you're there because I don't know about you, Mary, but I mean, I'm 46 this year and I felt like I'm going in, I'm in it. And I was in denial. I'm like, I'm 30. So I don't let you know. I'm not in perimenopause. So, you know, it, it, it's just acceptance. And then like you're saying, shifting, and we can go through it in the, our next episode, what shifting our life looks like and how to slow down. Uh, it does really help to name it so that we can, I guess, call, so-called blame it and then tame it and blame it, meaning, you know, we understand where it's coming from because it's kind of scary for many patients when, you know, there are circumstances with heart palpitations, you're waking up in the middle of the night, might be coupled with anxiety and sweats, and you think you're having a heart attack, and you go get to assessed by a cardiologist, and it turns out everything's clear, everything's fine, and perhaps you've had months without a menstrual cycle, and meanwhile, it's associated with that. It's the lack of hormones, 
or perhaps the swinging hormones, understanding that it's not just that we're low in hormones as we go through perimenopause, it's more like a roller coaster until you, we go through official menopause. We don't know that until a year later that we're there. So again, the follicle stimulating hormone blood test can be done, but it's you, you one month you might test it and your family doctor says, oh no, you're fine, you're not in perimenopause. And then you have no cycles for three months. And if you had it tested during that time, then maybe you would see that your follicle stimulating hormones off the charts because it's that last hoorah, like, hey, ovaries, wake up and ovulate. And sometimes you're releasing two eggs. You know, you're, you're maturing a couple of follicles and that's where your estrogen comes from. And your estrogen can go off the charts. And we'll often hear or read on Dr. Google, you know, uh, estrogen dominance when really it's extra estrogen excess. And then you can have uh, in that a moment. menstrual cycle. Yes, in that moment. That's right. Yes. So you're not always estrogen dominant in that moment for that time of the cycle. And then you have a heavy menstrual cycle bleed because you might not be making enough of progesterone to match that level of estrogen to keep the lining healthy. And so the lining thickens. And then you have, you know, other symptoms can happen where you have iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia and it can lead to brain fog. And I mean, the hormone shift itself can lead to kind of cognitive changes. I don't know about you, Mary, but when you are going through perimenopause or now that you're postmenopausal, if you were taking dried goods and putting it in the fridge or leaving your keys in places that you couldn't remember, but that's a common symptom too. So just yes. feeling like you're forgetful. And it's not just because of anxiety and a busy, you know, chaotic life. And it definitely helps to slow down and, and, and you know, support yourself so that you're doing things like that less, but, you know, understanding where it's coming from, it really is connected to hormones. Yes. And, you know, speaking of the hormonal surge, that may be also a time for some women that will all of a sudden look at this increased libido, whereas, gosh, like in overall, I feel like I'm asexual. <laughs> it's like I, I'm losing interest in having sex. And then coupled with those people that are trying to conceive, it's like it diminishes anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, did, did, are you experiencing a change of libido yourself? That is a very personal question. I am so sorry. <laughs> oh my no, gosh. I'm just teasing you. I'm totally joking with you because you know me, I'm very open. <laughs> no, I have always had a healthy libido my entire life, probably because of being a healthy PCOSer. I would say mostly when women with PCOS tend to have a slightly higher libido because of the testosterone. And I would say mine's been consistent. Um, I hope I get to keep it, you know, that's, it's an important part of connection for me in, in, uh, in my relationship. So I, uh, but I realize, and I see women who have reported that after they've gone through, uh, menopause and into post-menopause, they are, that was a big part of their life. And all of a sudden they're kind of feeling asexual and they want that back. So there are strategies for that if that's a big important part of your life. Some women are totally fine. And as couples, you can get intimacy in other ways, right? So you don't yeah. have to necessarily um, have the physical, you know, uh, connection like penis and vagina in order to feel satisfied. There's way, there's so many other ways to feel uh, emotionally, spiritually connected to your partner. Now, having said that, for women who are suffering with libido shifts or changing highs or lows, it can also equate to or come back to uh, dryness in the vaginal area, dryness or genital urinary issues. I, I remember reading it was as high as 70% of women, although the study you were talking about suggested about 50%, but I know it was really high, a, a large number of women who are suffering with either, you know, uh, bladder incontinence or dryness of the vaginal area, which can also extend to the urinary tract, which can, you know, like the opening, which can then cause recurring bladder infections because, you know, bacteria love irritated tissue, it just thrives in that. So, you know, lots of changes and you can, you might not notice it all the time. It might be every menstrual cycle, just as the hormones are dropping just before that could be where you are either getting yeast infections or, uh, bladder infections. Estrogen is a very alkalinized or yeah, it's an alkalinizing kind of hormone. So meaning like if you have or if you're lacking in it, then yeast can grow. So acidic. So uh, the change in gut flora is, is in, uh, sorry, vaginal and gut flora both change yes. if you're not careful with your nutrition. So we'll talk about that in another episode as you transition through perimenopause. So the other thing we didn't bring in, um, about awareness is the dry eyes. So some people have very severe dry eyes during this transition. And 
again, you know, it could be during perimenopause. Some people during perimenopause is smooth sailing. It's not, uh, and it's until it's there after they're fully done, then they experience more of these kinds of symptoms. So basically the bottom line is it can be different for everyone. So hopefully we're not freaking out. You may not have to experience all of these. Yes. Symptoms. And might. yeah. And with our strategies in our next episode, which you're going to listen to, you're going to hear about all the things that you can do to prevent or mitigate, you know, decrease these kinds of symptoms because it is doable, but it requires you to do things differently. As I mentioned early, right? We are we in just, a different phase. Yeah. And we want you to know that you're not alone and that there are so many symptoms of perimenopause that might make you feel a little bit loopy sometimes, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, having like all of a sudden heightened anxiety or a sudden depression when you've never had that in your life. I mean, you had stated you know, psychological symptoms is like 63% of women. And I have read that more than a third of um, medical doctors, female medical doctors have to change their site, uh, their work schedules in this phase of their life, because it's that intense for some women. So, you know, dry eyes, dry skin, uh, changes in our mood can happen. Uh, but there's a lot of things like, oh, joint pain, that was another one we, we did mention that, yeah, so many symptoms that can be managed and you can get yourself out of the the worst feelings of perimenopause and control it better. So you just feel like you're moving through a cycle rather than swimming or drowning in a cycle. You're just moving through the cycle. Yeah, you know, we can support I, you with that. I love that because, you know, thanks for bringing this up because we don't live in a vacuum. We live in our lives. So we have to be able to manage and keep going, you know, and, and a lot of women in their... 30s and 40s at this uh, and 50s even uh, it's like the height of your career so you're managing high level jobs and so it's like how do we do that when we're feeling crappy if you don't want me saying so so yeah let's let's have us thrive and we'll talk about this in the next episode <laughs>